Good morning. Welcome to church. Open your Bibles up to Psalm 56 this morning. Psalm 56 as we worship the Lord in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And we'll start with this psalm this morning. So Psalm 56, if you'd open your Bibles and we'll read it together corporately. Psalm 56, waiting for people to find their seats and get their Bibles so we can all do this together. Welcome to church. Hey, this is the day the Lord hath made. We shall what? Rejoice. So let's see some rejoicing out there. Amen. Psalm 56. Let's read it together. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He, fighting daily, oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is with me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Psalm 56. Look at verse 4. Verse 4, so the chorus, we'll sing it, and then we repeat that first phrase, in God I will praise his word. And verse 4 goes like this, in God I will praise his word, in God I have put my trust, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me, in God I will praise his word. All right, Psalm 56, verse 4, let's sing that. Psalm together. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. In God I will praise his word. All right, if you say you've never heard it before, you have now. We all know it. One more time, let's sing it and then we'll pray. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. In God I will praise his word. Thank you. Put those books away and get your hymn book out. Jim's going to lead us in prayer and song. Let us pray. Most holy and precious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day and the opportunity and the freedom we have to meet here this morning. We thank you for your loving kindness that you showed toward us, and for uh, your love, Lord, that you showed toward mankind, dying on Calvary's cross, shedding your blood to pay our sin debt. Father, we pray today as the word is proclaimed that you encourage and uplift your people. Remind us, Lord, of what we have in our salvation through Jesus Christ. And thank you again for uh, the opportunity that we have to meet as this body of Christ. Bless us today. Help us. Strengthen us. We thank you for your provision and protection in our lives. And we pray for the safety of this place, Lord, as we meet here this morning. We just give you all the praise, the honor, glory, thanksgiving, and blessing for all you do for us and will do for us in the future. We ask these things in the name of our living Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. 
Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Number 20 in your hymn book, stand with me if you will. Number 20. Number 304 in your hymn book. Number 304. I should gain 134 in your hymn books. 134.
Please be seated. Good to be in church. Good to sing God's hymns. Good that we're able to do that and allowed to and, and uh, have the freedom to. And thank God for, for God, for his goodness, for our church. Um, Brother Hamilton's with us today. And praise the Lord. Good to see him. Did you notice me? He's got some camouflage on today. And he's sitting back here. So he's out of this quarantine and, and back back with us. Going to be at his son's wedding here in a week or so. And good to have him with us. Good to see his face. This week we have food pantry, and if you want to help unload on Friday and then load up the bags, uh, Steve Viola, I guess, we can let you and uh, get that organized to do that. And then we need helpers on Saturday to distribute the food, so that's going to happen this week. Um, Golden Sunshiners meeting on Thursday, so praise the Lord for that, and I want you to come out to that, get that meeting back again at 10 o'clock. Praise the Lord. On the prayer bulletin in the back, there's a schedule of, of some events that are going to happen. We're going to have this dinner, all church dinner in the church on August 2nd during our evening service, or before our evening service, then we'll have our evening service in the gym again, and um, we'll have a fried walleye fish dinner. It's pretty cool. Looking forward to that. If you don't like fish, well, we can have some hot dogs for the non-fish likers, I guess, something. Or they can make some of those uh, hush puppies and just put the dough in there. You can have that. So anyway, pray, pray for these events that are coming up and some outreaches with the Super Saturday and the Youth Rally coming up next month. And, uh, yeah, thank the Lord. Trying to do something for him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Good to see George Scott out today. Praise the Lord. Glad he's able to be with us also. Amen. On the prayer list, continue to pray for... Betty Wilson and Roger Everhard and Dick McClain. Just looking at this prayer list. We're asked, we're asked to pray for Roger Mullins. He's the associate pastor at friend of um, Brother Nolan's. And he, he and his whole family have coronavirus down in West Virginia. And he's in the hospital with that. So pray for that. Pray for Brother Denman and the family as they um, deal with the death of his dear wife. Pray for our country, for sure. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. It's been good to sing his praises. Now we can talk to him in, in prayer. So let's do that right now. Pray to our God. Now, Brother Justin, would you come up and lead us in prayer this morning? Brother Justin's not here. So we'll have someone else lead us in prayer this morning. Um, Brother uh, Walter, would you lead us in prayer this morning? In fact, why don't we do that? Brother Paul, why don't you lead us in prayer this morning, if you would, sir? Okay. Brother Hamilton. Let's pray together as Paul leads us. Our gracious and heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, we're grateful again, God, to be in your house. And Lord, uh, pray you meet every need of the lonely heart this morning, Lord. You know every need of each heart, Father. You know every need of each person here, Lord. And Lord, we're thankful that we're saved. We're thankful, Father, for our health. We're thankful, dear Lord, for your many blessings that you bestow upon us each day, that even the things that we don't see, that save a sinner near as hell. Only you can reach down and save some soul that, uh, Lord, needs saved this morning, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that the, uh, nothing that would be said would fall on deaf ears and a cold heart, but it would fall on good ground with good understanding, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord. And Father, I pray you'd anoint the preacher as he preaches to us, Lord, give us ears to hear. And Lord, I just pray that sins of our heart, and Lord, if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, that you would bring it out in the message, Lord, that we be sensitive to your Holy Spirit this morning, that so we could hear from you. Now, Lord, I just pray that you be with each person today, and Lord, bless our time today, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The hymn book's out, go to hymn number 95. 
And as the hymn books are being opened, young people, if you would follow Andy and Rebecca to the gym or your preaching time there today. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Number 95. Open your hymn books up and let's stand one more time together as we sing this. people said amen. amen please be seated open your bibles up this morning to first john chapter 4 start first john chapter 4 I invite you to come back tonight lord willing i'm going to preach on um, faint not people are fainting out of the way with things going on and just give you some encouragement because god says he's able to keep you from falling away so let's look at some truths from the Word of God tonight on how not to faint. This morning, I want to continue some more thoughts on the love of God. Last week, if you remember, we looked at Titus chapter 3 and how talked about then the, the kindness and love of God appeared, remember? And it talked about how we were foolish and disobedient and deceived and, 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 and involved in lust and, and, and pleasures and and um, envy and malice and hate, full and hating one another. And yet, we talked about how the love and kindness of God appeared. And we talked about who God loves. And then last Sunday night, we showed how God loves and the love of God appeared. And talked about that. So I want to look at some thoughts about the love of God. One preacher said that preaching on the love of God is like hugging an elephant. I mean, you just can't get the whole thing, you know. Get this part of that part. There's, there's so much there. So look at First John chapter 4, and I pray this will help us this morning, and, and God will be exalted, and his people would be edified and challenged. First John chapter 4, 
verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Follow along as I read this passage of Scripture. He that loveth not knoweth not God, notice this phrase, for God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. One more prayer. God, thank you for the Bible. Help us, Lord, as we consider it this morning. Thank you for the truth therein. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for the freedom we have to proclaim your word. Thank you for the, the uh, ministry of preaching, God, and how it effectually works in our lives. So I pray you'd establish us. You'd encourage us, you'd, you'd comfort us, you'd, you'd help us through this preaching, bless the preacher and the hearers. God, we, we thank you for it, Lord, in Christ's name, amen. The Bible said in our verses two times that God is love, and we need to understand that the Bible teaches us about our God. He's an infinite God, right? He's big, he's, he's huge, he's everything. All, we looked at these old words as we studied the passion, the, the passion of Christ, the omniscient God, omnipotent God, omnipresent, right? So our God is so big, and part of his character that God is, I mean, part of his being is love, and his love is so big and vast and varied, we, we, we try to talk about this thing. The Bible said, Paul said, you know, to know the love of God which passeth knowledge, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's huge. So we're surrounded in the world by something we call conditional love. That's pretty much what most people do, yeah, I love you if, I love you because, I love you if you give me something. I'll love you if you provide for my needs. I'll love you if you let me. I'll, I'll love you if you believe like I do. Or I love you because you're pretty. I love you because you make me feel good. I, I love you because you're nice. I love you because you help me. These kind of loves. But we have a God who has an unconditional love. That's how God would love us. Look, it's amazing. We know our faults. We, we know that we're not always very lovable. In fact, sometimes we're even kind of hate, hateful. We, we know, honestly, we don't provide much for God. I mean, he's not going to love us because we provide for him. Why would God, who's perfect and holy and needs nothing, love us? And yet the great truth of the Bible is he does. That's the amazing thing. Time and time again, the scripture reminds us that God loves and God is love. And, and because God loves us, he gives and he does things for us. And the truth is we can disappoint God and we can grieve God and we can, we can move God because he loves you whom he loveth, he chasteneth. We understand that. However, there's nothing you can ever do in this life that will make God not love you. God is love. Now, that's a profound statement, really. It doesn't say God loves, or, or it says God is love. Not just he loves things, he is love. His nature, his essence is love. His character is love. It love permeates his very being and infuses all of his other characteristics. Look, even his characteristics, other characteristics of God, who he is, God's wrath. And, and God is judgment. And, and, and God is, has anger, and even God hates. But even in this love, it infuses all of these things. And, and because God's very nature is love, he demonstrates love to people. It's who, it's who he is. And it's experiencing the love of God is what makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world. God's love. So we looked at 
the unconditional aspects of, of God's love last week and, and how he bestows love and kindness even when people don't deserve it. And his Bible says his, his kindness is even to the, the wicked and the unthankful. And we saw God's unconditional love clearly showed out in the gospel. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet what? Sinners, Christ died for us. And, you know, we, we talked about the term last week I gave it, the divine rescue, the supernatural emancipation that God did for us. God's love. You say, well, you know, I've messed up, and I don't feel how God could love me. Well, at least that first statement's pretty good. You understand you've messed up. And to get right with God, with anyone, you need to understand you've messed up. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us. But consider this. When God says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, and he's talking about Jeremiah specifically, and then the principle uh, applies to all people, God said about Jeremiah, he said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee and ordained thee. Before you were even born. But God knew us and, and set us apart, had a purpose for our life before you were even born. And, and God knew every potential decision that we would make, and yet he still loves us. And God know, knew every sin that we might commit, yet he still died on the cross for your sins. It's our God. God commendeth his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Now, all people are loved by God, and, and he proved it by his, his sacrifice. And we looked last week at verses that showed how that God loved us even before we were saved. Isaiah chapter 38, 17, and and. and Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, John three sixteen. God so loved the world, even before you were saved, he gave his only begotten son. And we understand that. That love for you is present as long as you live on planet Earth. But his wrath will abide on you if you die rejecting God's love. Well, God will love everyone. He offers that love as long as you're alive but that love will, will end if you reject the love of God while you're alive. God's love. Now look over at John chapter 13. We want to look at some verses in John and Romans and back here to 1 John. So if you might keep your bookmark in 1 John, I want you to go to John, the book of John, chapter 13. And then you might want to mark that because we're going to go back to John. John chapter 13, and verse 1, the Bible says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, of course, his departing was going to be going to the cross, right, and and dying and sacrificing his life for us and shedding his blood and all this. But it says, Now, when the feast of the Passover Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world under the Father, look at this, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loved them unto the end. Notice that phrase, he loved them unto the end. Now this is talking about his own. It says his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. His, his own, his saved ones, he, his love is unchangeable. He loves them unto the end. Look, that night, Jesus Christ had said his end time's coming. He knew what was going to happen. He's, he's almighty God. He knew the betrayal that was going to come. He knew the, the denial that was going to come. He knew the, the, uh, the uh, I don't know, the forsaking the disciples were going to do and how they were going to hide. And He knew how they weren't going to believe him. He knew all of these things, and yet it says he still loved them. Love them to the end. What a promise. His love's unconditional. His love's unconditional. You may forget him. You may betray him. You may deny him. You may get away from him. You may not think about him. You may not believe him. But nevertheless, he loves you. He loves you. There's not a person here who's wondered or, 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 or betrayed God or, 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 or denied God, but that the Lord wants him to come back. The Lord loves him. Hosea 4, 4, 14, 4, we looked at this last week. He says, I'll heal the backsliding. I will love them freely. 
God wants to restore the backslidden one, but lest you think that, well, God will still love me and it's no condition, no, no problems, the Bible also says the way of the transgressors is hard. Look, if you're outside of God's will, if you're outside of God's plan, if you're living in sin, the wages of the sin is death, and it hurts you. It's hard. Why is my life so hard? Well, maybe you need to evaluate what kind of things you're doing with your life. Are you following God's plan or are you outside of God's plan? But anyway, he said, I will love my own unto the end. What a great promise. <laughs> what a great promise. Keep your bookmark here. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Can't hardly hug this elephant without looking at this part of it. Romans 8, verse 35. Talking about God loving us to the end. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he starts listing all these things. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the what? Love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look, when, when it comes time for you to die, you don't need to be afraid because death can't even separate you from the love of God. If you're in Christ, if you're his. Jeremiah 31 3 says, I love thee with an everlasting love for his believers. Now, here's a phenomenal verse. Look over at John chapter 17. Flip back over there. So, God loves us with an everlasting love. Look at how much he loves us if you're his, if you're saved. And he loves everyone who's, who he loves us all until the end. And then, if you're saved, he's going to love you forever and ever. John chapter 17, verse 23, look at this verse. Jesus praying this beautiful, that's called the high priestly prayer, and he's praying to God before he goes to the cross, and he's asking God's favor on, on him and, and, and the sacrifice he's going to make, and he's asking God's blessings on those that believe on him. And I always love this thought. There's a perfect prayer from a perfect prayer, and he says he's praying for them, and that's us who believed on his name. But I want to look at verse 23. So he's praying, and he says, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, look at this phrase, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Huh. I mean, if you, I mean, it sounds unbelievable. God loved us, he's talking about them, the ones that believe. Look at verse 20, get the context. So who's he praying? He says, neither pray I for these alone, that's his disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Did you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ through following the word of God? Then that's us. And he said in verse 23, thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. I mean, I don't think you'd believe that. It says God loves you as much as he loves Jesus if you didn't see it in the word of God. I mean, that's what it says. <laughs> I mean, God, his beloved son, whom he's well pleased, and he loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, maybe you don't, you don't necessarily question that God can love or that God would love some people, but, I mean, love me? I mean, come on, I mean, this world is huge, and, and who am I, the whole world, uh, this, whole, this whole world, 7.5 billion people in the world or something like that, and we can't even comprehend these kind of numbers, and how could God love us all? I mean, it doesn't seem possible, it's, it doesn't even seem likely, I mean, surely God has bigger things on his mind than to love each one of these people, us. I mean, you know, Bible people felt that way. Moses said, when God had called him to do something, Moses said unto God, Exodus 3.11, who am I? <laughs> Who am I? I mean, this, this guy that could go into Pharaoh and deliver the people. 
And Gideon felt that way when God told him to do something for him. Gideon said unto him, Judges 6, 15, Oh, my Lord, where shall I save Israel? Behold, my family's poor, and I'm, I'm a nobody. A guy, what? Even David said that when God wanted him to, to do something for God and to establish the temple. In 1 Chronicles 29, 14, David says, Who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly a, a sacrifice to them? Who am I? I mean, maybe you said that, God, why would you even love me? Who am I, God, that you'd love me? All these people in the world, how can God love everybody? Look, I think there's an understanding. If you have children, okay, so when my firstborn was born, Aaron was born, um, out in Yuma, Arizona, and Natalie went to the hospital there in Yuma, and she was in labor for a long time with this boy. And finally, she was in labor for so long, the doctor was worried about her health, so Aaron was, had to be taken C-section after, I don't know, 20 hours or something of labor. So then Aaron's born, and, and then it's amazing how when you have a child and you get this child, there's this bond of love that you have for this child. You been there? There's just something else. I mean, you have this child, and there's this love that's there, and you think, well, how could I ever love anyone like I love this baby? Well, several years later, Natalie's pregnant with Annie out in Arizona. And, and so just remembering the, the labor that this happened on a Wednesday night, she said, I need to go to the hospital. It's Wednesday night. I'm teaching teen Bible study. I was the, worked with the youth and, and the music in, in Yuma as an associate pastor back in the day. And so, Natalie, it's during the, I think it was during the class or something. You said, I need to. Compassion, <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to encourage her in the things of God so she's not backsliding and staying home. So she's at church, and, and then she said, I need to go to the hospital. And I said, well, you know, I understood. I said, well, that's fine. So the preacher's wife took her to the hospital, and I'm thinking, I mean, it was 20 hours with Aaron. You know, it's going to be a long time. And so Choir practice was after Wednesday night. I said, I'm going to stay for choir practice. You know, she's in the hospital. It's going to be fine. So she went there, had choir practice, and I went to the hospital, and they rushed me in there, put the, the gown on me, and right away because, I mean, Annie was ready to be born. And she was able to have Annie naturally just in, you know, real quick time. And I'm thinking, all right, I got one baby, and then here comes Annie, and, and it's amazing. All of a sudden, Here's this other baby that somehow I could love just like I love this other child. And you wonder how that is. How could you love each one of your kids the same way as you love them? I mean, it's, I love them all equally, but I love them, you know, as individuals. But you love them all, right? I mean, it's, it's how it is. And then, and then, of course, Nathan was born on Christmas Day here in, in, in uh, Canton here. But that's how God loves you. You're one of his children. And if we as humans can relate how you love, you know, you love your different grandchildren. You love them all, but you love them different, right? And your children, but you love them all. And that's our God. He, he loves us all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, though. You can hurt him. He still loves you. You can hurt him. You can offend him. How sad is God that's done everything for us. You can, you can grieve him. Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You can disappoint God. You can, you can provoke his anger. You can induce his chastening hand. In fact, you can even expose his holy hatred. The God that loves can also hate at the same time because he's God. But he continues to love us even when we disappoint him, even when we hurt him, even when we reject him. There's nothing you can do to make God not love you in this life. Something else. Love's not something that God does, it's who God is, love. God doesn't pick and choose who he loves. God's love, we're loved, every single one of the 7.5 billion people on this earth, these undeserving people, God loves us. Hmm. And if you're saved, God loves you to the end like he loves Jesus. Something told you I was reading this church father's book August he said 
God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. He didn't love us because he needed us. He loves us because he wants us. What a God. Who does he love? I read this thing. It's pretty cool. This guy put together all these categories of people that God loves. Alphabet. The categories of people God loves, beginning with the letter A. God loves artists, astronauts, and aerospace engineers. He loves accordion players, ankle biters, animal rights activists, airplane pilots. He also loves athletes, acrobats, and accountants, even during tax season. He loves people from Alabama, Alaska, Africa, and Albania. God loves absent-minded people, awkward people, assertive, authoritarian people, antisocial people, and aggravating people. How about bees? God loves babies, babes, boys, bankers, and band leaders. He loves ballerinas, Bible readers, biology teachers, bird watchers, bus drivers, including bad ones. God loves bookworms, bachelors, botanists, bowlers, baby boomers, and boomerang throwers. He loves beekeepers, BBC watchers, blondes, brunettes, and even people with blue hair. God also loves boars, the beat up and the burned out. God loves bosses, braggarts, bag ladies, bartenders, brats, people with braces, bushmen, and Baptists. God. Look, there, there's nothing we can do to earn God's love. God, God loves us. We're already loved simply because he made us. We're his creation, and he loves every single one of his creatures. And then in a special way, when you're recreated, doesn't the Bible say that if you're saved, God, God, God recreated us? You're a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? He loves us because we're recreated in Christ, and he can't help loving you like he loves Christ because the Bible says if you're saved, you're in Christ. See how that works? 1 John chapter 4 again. Look at the verse. We read it. 1 John chapter 4. So skip down to verse 10, given a description of love. 1 John 4 and verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, because we didn't. We were all at enmity with God. Our, our sins have separated us from God. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the, the satisfaction, what our sins deserved. The penalty on our sins, the wages on our sins. Jesus Christ came in, and he took that on himself. Now look, I don't deserve it, but he loves me. I didn't earn it, but he loves me. I don't measure up, but he loves me. And, and we read all this thing, and all we can say is, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah about that thing. Now, here's how we think, we, we think sometimes. Remember the little girls game or the, maybe the teen girls when, when they like some boy and they pick the flower. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Right? And we're kind of like that with, with God. When we have a good day, he loves me. When we have a bad day, he loves me not. When we are feeling good, oh, he loves me. When we're feeling sickly, he loves me not. When, we, when we're in church, he loves me. When we go through the week and don't think about it, he, he loves me not. When, when, we, when we're obeying God, he loves me. When we're disobeying him, and he loves me not. And sometimes our lives, he loves me, he loves me not. And see, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of the New Testament. That's not the God of Christianity. God is love. And his flower, I guess would only have one petal, and his flower petal would say, he loves me. He loves me. That's our God. And God's love, it, it makes you significant. You think about it, God loves you uniquely. Just like you talk about your children, you love them individually in a special way. God loves you uniquely and specially. God loves you. Dio Moody said this. He said, 
I've often thought I would like to have but one text, and if I thought I could only make the world believe that God is love, I would only take that text and go up and down the earth trying to counteract what Satan has been telling them, that God is not love. God is love. He has made the, Satan has made the world if, believe it effectually that God is not love. It would not take 24 hours to make the world come to God if you can only make them believe that God is love. If you can really make a man believe you love him, you've won him. And if I could only make people really believe that God loves them, what a rush we would see for the kingdom of God. Oh, how they would rush in. But man's got a false idea about God, and he'll not believe that God's a God of love. It's because he doesn't know him. Look, here's a famous phrase if you're a teacher, if you work with kids at all, you ought to know this, this phrase, this famous teacher's thing is, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's all this information about God and stuff, but, but understanding the the great love of God helps you see God in a different light. We understand that God loves us. He loves us. Then we can know, want to know what this God that loves us has to say. Luke chapter 15 talks about these stories about these three things that were lost. Remember, there was the lost sheep, and there was the lost coin, and then there was the prodigal son who was lost from his father, Right? And that's in Luke chapter 15. And what unites these stories it, is that when the searchers found what they were looking for, they, they invited all their friends and the family. They threw a party. They celebrated because what was lost was found. When, when they found that lost sheep that was, that was out there of the 90 and 9 that was saved, but he found that one lost one, Luke 15, 6 says this, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep, which was lost. And when the lady found that coin that she'd lost in her house and she found it, she said in verse 9, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I'd lost. And when the prodigal son came home and he came to the father, and the father says, This my son was dead, he's alive again, who was lost, he's found. He says, They begin to make merry. They rejoice, had the party, right? Kill the fatted calf. You're that one. You're that sheep. You're that coin. You're that son away from God. God loves you so much that he, he's willing to search the wild and dark earth and world to find you, to restore you. God loves you so much that he's willing to move the furniture and tear up the carpet and, and, and tear out the cabinet so he can find you. God's watching every moment of the day waiting for you to return home. Because when you do, he's there to help you and to pour out his love on you our God. You ever felt distant from God? You ever felt away from God? You ever felt away from God? You know one thing that will make you feel away from God is your sin. And look, that's, you're not alone in that. Sin does that. Sin will make you feel that God doesn't love you. Sin will make you feel you're not close to God. Sin will make you, you, you feel that God's not there, that he doesn't care. It's sin. Sin in your life because you didn't care. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sin. You won't feel close to God living in sin. You won't feel God's love if you don't choose to follow his ways. It's your choice. There's a God of love. He's out there. You say, well, I don't feel that love. How are you living? How's your life? Look, he's still love, but you won't enjoy the special benefits of God's love because you're not near him. Look, think about, think about a child. So you, you're, you have a loving home and a protecting home and a, a home that has good food and, 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 and conversation and things. And that son, that child, he's a wayward child and he goes away. He doesn't want anything to do with the home. Well, when he's away, he doesn't get the mom's good cooking. He doesn't get the hugs. He doesn't get the fellowship. He doesn't get the, the communication. He doesn't get the conversation, the words of encouragement. He doesn't get the family protection. He's away, right? I guarantee you that mama still loves him. But he's lost out of the benefits of experiencing the love by being away from the love. Maybe that's you today. Oh, yeah, God loves you. But you're not experiencing that love because you are not near him. You're not by him. Look over at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. 
I want you to see the verse. We quoted the first part of it, that I love thee with an everlasting love, but notice what else God says. God's love. Jeremiah chapter 31, Old Testament, find it there in the major prophets. They're just called major prophets because their books are bigger. <laughs> Jeremiah 31. And again, if you're new to the Bible, there's a table of contents in the front. You can always find these things until the Bible becomes um, good to you like your remote control does and you know what channels are on the TV. So God's talking about he's going to restore Israel and he's going to bring them back. But the principle is for, for people, for us. Look what he says in verse 3. Jeremiah 31. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Look, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31, 3. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, his chosen ones. If you're saved, if you're a believer in God, he loves you with an everlasting love. What a blessing. But you get away from that love, and he knows that hurts you. So he says, therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I've drawn thee. God draws us to him because he loves us. God draws us to him because he knows that when we're away from him, we lose out on the benefits. He knows that when we're, when we're away from him, we're not experiencing the fellowship and the good things that happen with that love, so he draws us to it. That's why James said, draw an eye to God, and he'll draw an eye to you. When you draw an eye to God, then you experience those benefits of blessing and conversation and protection and, and food and, and all these things we talked about the, the wayward child doesn't have. God draws us to him. Because he knows we're better off experiencing and fellowshipping in his love. Are you away from him? God loves you. One more verse. Look over at John again. John chapter 15. John 15. John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All right, look at it again. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now notice, greater love hath no man than this. This is the height of human love. Greater love hath no man than this. It's, a man, it, it's, it's someone in the military that is with his, his troop and, and he sees a live grenade that's going to kill them all that jumps on that thing and gets blown up to save his friends. That's great love. And military guys have done that. And we appreciate our military and we honor them and we respect them and we're thankful for them. Or, or it's a, you know, a crime scene is going to happen and and you see the criminal and you jump in front of the bullet and you take the bullet for your friend. <laughs> take a bullet for him. Or, or you push someone out of the, you, the car's coming down, they didn't see it crossing the street, and you run out and you push them out of the way and the car hits you. Or there was this video that um, Nathan showed me, then I looked it up su- subsequently. Something happened last week. There was a fire in this apartment uh, building. Maybe you saw that thing. What an odd thing. And someone had taken a video of it. And the, the, the lady realized that her child was upstairs and in the fire so she goes into the building and there's flames on the fourth floor of this apartment building coming out and and she goes in there and and she grabs her son and she throws him off the balcony and this a couple guys there and this one guy dives down and catches the baby on the ground it's quite an amazing thing you can it's amazing now people can record things i don't know what they're doing recording it and trying instead of trying to help but someone recorded it and, and then they caught that thing, and then the story goes on. There was another guy, and so the, the lady, they, people were yelling for her to jump, too, and she's on fire up there, but she didn't jump. She went back in because another one of her children was still in there. Well, another rescuer man was down here, and he ran into the building, and he saved the second child. And then there's a picture of, so the lady ends up dying. Her two children are saved. There's a picture of these two men with the, with the, guy, with the father and this and that, and, 
you know, running back into a burning building to save someone else, that's greater love at no man than this. A man would lay down his life for his friends and his family. I mean, that's greater love, but that's the greatest of human love. But what about God's love towards me? A greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Look over at verse 14. It goes on. He says, you're my friends. Verse 14. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. (laughs) Wow. How good of a friend are you to God? You're his friend if you do what he commands you. I'm afraid that there's many times that we're not very good friends of God. We're not doing what he commands us, right? Jesus Christ laid down his life for much more than friends. He didn't just die for his friends. He died for his enemies and everyone in between. You better be glad that he didn't just die for his friends because we miss that mark too often, don't we? For God, Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And then the verse goes on, it says, For scarcely will a righteous, for a righteous man would one die, and peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, he ran into the burning building for those who totally disobey and disregard him and gave his life. He took the bullet for the murderer and the, and the thief and the, and the, and the adulterer and, and, the, and the gang member. I mean, Jesus Christ dove on the bomb for the, for the murmurer and the spiteful and the proud and the haughty and the thankless and the prostitute and the drug dealer, and the ISIS thug, and the rioter. He went to the cross for you and for me, even though we weren't acting like friends. The greatest love, all of us as enemies. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Do you know him? Do you know him? Why wouldn't you want to come to him? Why would you want to reject that love when he wants to be your friend, to give you a love that never ends? Why would you keep saying no to that kind of love? Are you not saved today? Why again would you slap God in the face and say, I don't want that kind of love? (laughs) And if you are saved, Maybe you need to come back into that fellowship because you're not enjoying the pleasures of being near to a God that loves you. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. God, thank you for your amazing love. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord, but I guess there's hardly much more we could be thankful for than a love like that. God, if there's one here in this room that doesn't know you as their Savior, that's putting it off, that doesn't, hasn't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to save them from their sins, right now, God, would you put deep conviction on their heart? Help them to realize that without you, there's going to be an end to that love, and then there's going to be eternal wrath in hell for them because they have rejected the free gift of love. And God, for Christians, Lord, as we have backslidden, I thank you your loving kindness is ever there. Help us, Lord, to realize how foolish it is to be away from you and what a blessing it is to be near you. So I pray that we would draw nigh to you. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church this morning. Bless the invitation, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the Bible says if all all unbelievers and liars are going to have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, because if you are not honest with yourself that you need God, you're lying to yourself, that you can get to heaven, that, that, that there's some other way besides Jesus Christ. You're a liar, and you're going to go to hell. But Christ said, there's none of the name under heaven given among men by where you must be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. Whosoever called upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Are you saved? You say, preacher, 
I don't want to reject that love of God anymore. God, talk to me. Would you please pray for me? I'm not saved. I, I need Christ. I want to be saved. Uplifted hand. Why would you be ashamed of it? You love that God. Please pray for me. Anyone like that this morning? I'm not saved. If you're watching this today, you're not saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you are saved, well, the invitation then for you is, God, I want to be closer to you. I th- maybe just thanksgiving for all he's done. Amen. We'll sing an invitation song. Stand with me. If you'd like someone to pray with you at this altar, we're, we're here to help you. If you'd just like to pray in your seat or sing the song, stand up. We'll sing what song, Brother Jim? 147. Amazing 147. Grace. We'll sing this as an invitation song this morning as a closing hymn. 147. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved, how Precious did thy grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many danger, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace had brought. forever in his love abiding in his love when we've been there 10,000 years let's sing that last verse praise God when we've been there 10,000 years church today. I invite you to come back tonight again for this message on fainting not. I pray it'll be a blessing to you. I know it'll be a help. So I invite you to come back out tonight to church. Um, just a reminder on seeing Viola uh, about scheduling to be here to help on Friday morning for unloading the on the truck and getting the bags packed up and, and these kind of things and then to help out on Saturday. Regular service this week on Wednesday. Sunshine is Thursday. Praise God. Have a good week. God bless you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Brother uh, Sam Baltzley, would you give us a dismissal prayer, please? Amen. Just stand there for a little bit. Let anyone wants to get out first without the fellowship in the lobby. We'll give you a chance to leave first. If you want to do that. Then we'll have a chance to fellowship afterwards.